This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. It's Behave with Arden Moore. This show that teaches you how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Join Arden as she travels coast to coast to help millions better understand why cats and dogs do what they do. Get the latest scoop on famous faces. They're perfectly pampered pets in Who's Walking Who in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails. Garner great pet tips and have a doggone fur-flying fun time. So get ready for the pause and applause as we unleash your all-behave host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome to the All Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Now, you may not realize this, but there is actually a special bank catering to dogs and cats. Now, the dogs aren't getting issued debit cards. And the cats are certainly not opening up, you know, safe deposit boxes to stash their extra catnip. But what these banks do is priceless because they're saving lives. On today's show, we are going to be taking a closer look at blood banks for dogs and cats. And here to guide us is one of my favorite veterinarians on the planet. Please give pause and applause to Dr. Zach Pilosoff. Welcome to the show, Dr. Zach. Thank you. It's happy to be back again. We had a good first show that one time, so this is great. I'm really excited. Yeah, you didn't know where I was going with that bank thing, did you? That, I mean, if you thought of that on the spot, that was pretty darn good, let me tell you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> hey, pet pals, after we take a quick break, we're going to learn if your dog or cat may qualify as a genuine lifesaver as a blood donor and how blood donations do save animals' lives. So sit, stay, we'll be right back. Time for a pause. For furry ones, actually, sit and stay. All Behave will be right back. Hey, pet pals, Arden Moore here from the Old Behave Show, talking to you about a great company called Natural Farm. They make all natural dog chews and bones. Yum yum for the dogs. They are single ingredients. They're very nice to the environment and they support a lot of animal welfare groups. Check them out for your dogs. They're bully sticks, gullet sticks, collagen sticks, and peanut butter, chicken, and other flavors. You get to choose what chew for your dog. Go to naturalfarmpet.com. Pause up. Use promo code BEHAVE15 for 15% off store-wide. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. All Behave is back with more tail-wagging ways to achieve harmony in the household with your pets. Now back to your fetching host, America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore. Welcome back to the Old Behave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. Joining us today is a true health champion for pets. Now, he's board certified in critical care and emergency medicine, one of my favorite kinds of topics. He is regarded as one of the top advocates in integrative medicine for pets. He is also a consulting veterinarian for Healthy Paws Pet Insurance. Oh, one more thing. He's a good guy. Too. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Zach Pilosoff. Now, you told me your name pronounced. It's P I L O S S O P H, which you say to everybody is soft pillow backwards. <laughs> soft pillow backwards. I Easy love it. Way. I can just see a little. Well, I love that you know a lot and you're helping pets and you're all over the map. In fact, at the end of the show, We're going to find out what he's up to next. But today, let's talk about the vital topic, and that's the need for blood donors for dogs and cats and other companion animals. And maybe, pet pals, maybe your dog or your cat could be the next hero. So, Dr. Zach, there's blood banks for pets, and it seems like it's not as well known, I I think, as it should be. Let's do the overall view. Can you tell us about the national scene? Yeah, I mean, it's literally no different than humans. You know how we have the big red trucks everywhere and and there's just statements all year long that we're in a blood shortage. It's the same with animals. And 
<laughs> you know, we're just specifically talking about dogs and cats right now because I don't think they have blood banks for smaller pocket pets or exotics yet. But ultimately, even with those two, the major companion animal breeds, we still have a, an extreme shortage in general. And then that doesn't even include animals that have different blood types. So um, I've worked at a few hospitals that are um, emergency clinics or that are GP hospitals because that, you know, as you know, as some may know, I travel across the country for um, as a per diem vet. So I worked at many different clinics, you know, dozens um, over the course of a year. And some of them do have these little uh, populations or banks or um, blood donor on call pets and pet parents. But in general, it's just as much in shortage as with the human side and animals need blood every single day. Let's talk about it because I understand you're the doctor, not me. That the blood types, you know, for people, A, B, A, B, positive or O, but that's not the ones for dogs and cats. What are they? Yeah. So in dogs, there's actually, I think, about 12 different blood types. Oh, my and, gosh. Really? Yeah, pretty crazy. And now there's only like about one to maybe two or three that are actually clinically relevant, meaning something that we have to worry about when we're considering an animal and if they need a transfusion. And But in general... Okay. You know, there's there's one main one and there's one or two that may cause mild reactions as well. Um, and the, the one that everyone will test for if your animal's in the emergency room is called DEA 1.1 and either either 1.1 positive or 1.1 negative. So that's kind of our, our decision making in terms of in an if an animal can get a donation from another animal, just as with humans, if you're an A or a B or an O or positive, negative in that direction. So um, that's the main one. There's a couple other ones that can cause reactions. One's called doll and one's called 1.2. But um, and then there's the other nine. But for the most part, those are the ones we worry about. Wow. Well, you probably already know what my blood type is based on my personality. You're ready for it. I'm B positive. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Seriously, I am. I'm, what about cats? What, now, that's not the DEA 1.1. It's something different, isn't it? Yeah. Cats are more similar to, to humans. Um, cats have A's and B's. Um, and for the most part, the heavy majority of animals are type A, but then a lot of the exotic animals or ones that have maybe, maybe ones that have, we don't know their background, like they're a feral cat or a cat that was rescued from the wild, they may have a mix um, and they may be a, a B as well. But for the most part, cats are A, B and, um, and for the most, out of that, most of the cats are A and some are B and those are like mostly your exotic breeds. Now, you graduated from Tufts University, their coming school of veterinary medicine. Do most veterinary schools have blood banks or not? I'm not sure if I could speak for all of them. I know that if they are going to be one of the figures that are going to be more adamant about trying to at least have a population or a bank because they see a higher you know, case rate. And so yeah. but when I was there, there definitely was, you know, we have a, almost like a list of like, nurses that work there or like people that are in the you know in the, in the close community that you know almost give themselves on call in, if an animal needs a donation but at the same time you know there's also a lot of you know, sharing through the veterinary community of you know, if blood products are needed that we can call another hospital for short or something well is there some like a central clearing house you know like there's the american red cross there's you know, for humans. I know I've read there's an Indy bank, there's the Mount Laurel in New Jersey, but I don't know. Is there one central blood bank for pets? Not yet. Uh, not that I know of, at least either. It's uh, it's all kind of done in little uh, communities. Each community is, you know, working with, with the other hospitals in the area to try and uh, maintain blood products. Wow. It sounds like we need a national center, don't we? So, you know, you have nothing else to do, Dr. Zach, with all the, let's just create one. <laughs> What are some of the reasons, Let's before we go to our break, what are some of the reasons that a dog or a cat may need a blood transfusion? What would be some of the circumstances? Yeah, so there's four different categories that would cause an animal to lose blood. The first would be loss. Second would be consumption. Third would be destruction. And then fourth would be decreased production, which is one that least likely needs it. So loss would be very easy. If, you know, they have a wound or trauma that causes them to lose a lot of blood at once. Um, consumption would be something where a similar idea where something causes an insult to the body and over time they the body is kind of consuming those red blood cells and they go down uh, third would be destruction uh, where the body is actually attacking the red blood cells itself you know, through an immune mediated or an autoimmune cause and then decreased production would be the source of where your red blood cells are made and which is in your bone marrow so if you have a bone marrow disease so those are the four main categories that would cause an animal to eat it so it could be like a trauma, mm -hmm. they could eat toxins, they could nick an artery, and they could have a disease. Did I do it, Nick? Did I, did I translate? 
Sort those, are, of. those are good. Those are good synonyms. Those are good synonyms. I'd say. I try to listen to you, Doctor Snack. I really yeah. try. So I have a very sweet dog, Kona, mm-hmm. and Kona is great at a veterinary clinic. Kona loves everybody. She's a certified therapy pet. She helps me teach pet first aid. But I don't know what makes a good blood donor dog. What are you looking for as a veterinarian or a vet tech? What would say this dog physically? personality-wise, breed-wise, what makes this dog coveted as a donor dog? Yeah, so there's, there's actually a, a general standard list of things that we look for, actually. Um, and some are qualitative and some are quantitative. So um, Ooh, I like how you talk. Thing, okay, keep going. <laughs> qualitative would be kind of what you just said. Like, are they a, a dog that's a good temperament? Are they calm? Are they going to sit through a transfusion? Or are they going to sit through a, a blood extraction procedure with minimal to no sedation? That would be kind of something that is a, um, you know, a qualitative okay. measure. Um, quantitative things would be um, their age. So we usually want an adult animal that's not a puppy or a geriatric. So usually one to you. <laughs> I um, call those the prime time players, prime time pups. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So usually like one to eight, one to seven is like a good, you know, where an animal's immune system and their their hematologic system is most robust. Most animals okay. have to be over 20 kgs or about 40 pounds. They need to be like in a, a general good health, like their body condition score needs to be good and their muscle condition score. Good body mass. Okay. Yep. And they have to be up, up to date on their vaccinations and their red blood cell counts have to be at a minimum of, of 40%, which is like the low normal um, range. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The last thing is actually we do uh, want them to be negative for that um, that blood type, the DEA 1.1. We want them to be negative so that they don't have potential antigens that could be reacted to either the first or second time a transfusion happens. And then we would test for like major um, major blood pathogens that would maybe infect the red blood cells or the other cells in, in the blood system. So those are qualitative, quantitative things. I love it. Now, what about cats because <laughs> cats need blood too and you've mentioned that cats are mostly a and some b but again what's the requirement for a feline blood donor because i'm looking over at my healthy boy casey the ginger cat i don't think he's really volunteering but i'm just asking what's the special uh situation for cats what are you looking for I would say it's relatively similar. At the same time, you know, I, I don't think that most cats will sit through it. So like most cats we do sedate and we do sedate, you know, I'd say a third to a half of the dogs as well. It's just, it makes it easier for them. And if an animal's healthy, then sedation is never a concern for us on the doctor side. It's only animals that have underlying health conditions. So these are healthy animals that can tolerate sedation very well. And they could honestly safely get sedated every single day if they needed to. It's Sedation is not something that we would consider a health risk. Yeah. So, um, but um, you know, that what we do is uh, very similar. It's exactly the same general list. The PCV may be changed a little bit just based on cats having a little bit lower amount, but we wouldn't be testing, obviously, for the same infectious agents and for the same antigens on the blood uh, cells themselves. We would just be looking for A or B, and that would be it. All right. That sounds cool. Hey, everybody, we're speaking with Dr. Zach Pilosoff, and he is based in Miami, but he's been all over the world and he's still going all over the world. He is an ER and critical care veterinarian. He is also an uh, integrative veterinarian. I love that. He's a vegan, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. And he knows how to save lives. We're going to dive into uh, more about blood donors and what you can do after we take this break. So sit, stay. We'll be right back. Time for a walk on the red carpet, of course. All Behave will be back in a flash right after these messages. Take a bite out of your competition. Advertise your business with an ad in Pet Life Radio podcasts and radio shows. There is no other pet-related media that is as large and reaches more pet parents and pet lovers than Pet Life Radio. With over 7 million monthly listeners, Pet Life Radio podcasts are available on all major podcast platforms. And our live radio stream goes out to over 250 million subscribers on iHeartRadio, Odyssey, TuneIn, Stitcher, and other streaming apps. For more information on how you can advertise on the number one pet podcast and radio network, visit PetLifeRadio.com slash advertise today. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Holy hound dog. Hi, this is Burt Ward. 
and you're listening to the Old Behave Show with Arden Moore on Pet Life Radio. Listen every week, same pet time, same pet channel. We're back from the lot. Just checked the paper and we had a record showing at the box. The letterbox, that is. Now back to Obehave. Here's Arden. Welcome back to the Obehave Show on Pet Life Radio. I'm your host, Arden Moore. I just wondered, we have Dr. Zach Kolosoff on our show. and We're talking about dogs and cats who may be good blood donors and they can help dogs and cats who are in need. We talked about some of the reasons, you know, they get hit by a car. They got into some toxin medicine. They have some kind of a, a disease that's really not, the red blood cells aren't doing well. They need good, healthy blood. And you mentioned some of the criteria for the dogs and cats to be donors. I understand uh, a lot of places that do have blood banks in their area, don't they kind of, the dogs and cats get some nice treats and maybe their pet parents get like a a little thank you, like a debit card or something. There's been some other things, have you heard about, that try to entice the pet parents to bring their pets in to donate blood? Yeah, you know, it's like, I remember when I was younger, I, uh, you know, I would I would try to do every 45 days with the, uh, the- Give your blood? blood donations as well. And yeah, you know, you go, you get like a $5 gift card to somewhere. Or, you know, a lot of times the, you know, the vets that do this, they'll offer like a free physical exam or, you know, discounts on diagnostics or- if they're if or they're an own pet or sometimes you know if you're a pet to a vet nurse then you're out of luck because they're just going to volunteer you you know but uh, well i do know um there was a show in december that was spotlighting on television some hero dogs and there was a newfoundland named lagartha who is at the mount laurel blood bank in new jersey and yes belongs to a vet tech deb consiglio i think is her name and that dog whenever the rotation is due goes in and happily gives blood and saves has saved dozens of lives but let's get into it where do you draw blood on a dog or a cat how much blood do you take so the first question where we draw blood is from the main jugular vein so that would be why sedation a lot of times is necessary um for these animals you know some of them don't really like that so yeah don't mess with my jugular doc yeah. no not today okay yeah you know, so uh so the, it always goes from the jugular vein and and that's important because obviously there's a lot of vital structures around there so we don't want to you know most of the nurses that do this are extreme experts you know that they you know they, they could hit a vein in a winter storm with blindfold on so you know. but the jugular is close to the heart is that better because the blood's getting back to the heart would tell me is that is that why or is it just a good vein it's the largest act you know access okay. point and that makes it easiest for us to to get from so um so mostly it's from it's from the jugular vein which is the largest peripheral vein we can get and then the second question you asked how much can we take we can take usually healthfully somewhere between 15 to 20 milliliters per kilogram, or and I guess per pound, you just multiply. So you know, 30 to 40 milliliters per pound. Okay. And so let's, let's do a scenario. You got a 50 pound dog. Well, how much can they safely extract and have that dog still be doing good? Well, you know, you're going to make me do milliliters. I can't do it, doc. Yeah. It'd be 1500 to 2000 milliliters. I guess, technically you could take. Okay. And, so but, is it like one one eighth of their blood or one twentieth of their total blood volume or what? Well, actually, that's funny to say that. We, we don't think about it like that. But in other mathematical equations, 90 mils per kilogram is considered a blood volume. So if we're taking 15, that would be about one sixth. And if we're taking 20, that would be somewhere between one sixth and one fourth. So technically, or one fifth, I mean, so technically it, it's about maybe around one fifth of their blood volume. And that's, that's definitely safe. An animal can actually lose, you know, almost more than a third of their blood and actually be okay and actually live fine. So, you know, we're staying below that, obviously, but it's, you know, right, it's right. about a fifth to a sixth of their blood volume. Now, I'm so amazed at your math skills. That was pretty <laughs> good. What'd you think of that? That was pretty good. Don't make me repeat that. Now, once they are good and they seem to be good candidates, healthy blood, healthy attitude, how often safely could a dog or cat give blood to help others? Mm, I think it's around the same. That's actually something I have to look up again because it's different for dogs and cats, but it's usually about the same period of time if I had to think. It's 
It's different in other places too. It's usually around like the 42, 45 day mark from what I remember correctly. But usually I think we stay around the two month range is kind of something like a safe bet. Um, at least in the the hospitals that I've worked at with the colonies that we have. And I don't think I, met, I don't think we talked about it before, but the the cat situation is a bit different than the dogs. So the dogs, you know, the, the pet parents will come in or the nurses will come in. Cats, we have, and just as a side note, we a lot of the hospitals that do this will have a colony of cats that were relinquished. So they will just have this room of cats that they all in- intermingle and they hang out and they're just blood donors. And that I've seen this maybe three, four, three or four times at least in, in, in multiple states. But they'll have a room in the hospital or they'll have, you know, a, a population either at a shelter or, or rescue yeah. that the cats are just cycled through and they get to live a life of luxury with other cats and they just donate blood every, you know, every six to eight weeks. So it's uh and that's not a bad gig. Well, so like a community cat colony, so that they are a bit socialized and they've been spayed and neutered, updated on all their vaccinations, and they landed uh, a new place to dwell and they just have to pay rent by giving blood. Pretty much, they uh, they get to live on a you know a little uh, island resort for the rest of their life, and all I got to do is get poked once every two months. So I think that it's an interesting. I, I think this is fascinating. But all right, now there's the actual blood, but there's other things. What are the forms that you would use as a veterinarian to help an animal in need? There's different types of blood, right? There's the platelets, and you know. Help me. Yeah. Well, you're, but the word you're looking for is blood products. So that's that's. Thank that's you. Word. Blood yep. products for two hundred, Doctor Zach. Okay, yep, go for right. it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, so yes, yeah, so blood products. There's many actually, but the main ones we work with are pack red blood cells and plasma. It's the most common. We can sometimes transfuse whole blood, which would be when those two are still together. And I'll talk about what those two are in a second. But um, okay. whole blood would be another one. And then there's other different extractions we can do. So we can sometimes do platelets or platelet rich plasma. And then sometimes we can um, do other liquids, something called uh, cryoprecipitate, etc. So there's other things. But ultimately, when we're working with an animal, we kind of decide does it need blood cells or does it need blood liquid? And that's what we do. So packed red blood cells is essentially when you take your blood and you say, all right, what is this made out of it? It's made out of um, about 45% cells, and it's made of 55% liquid. And so we would take that blood and we would separate it into two different things. We would take the cells. And that's we amazing. That. Yeah. And then we would take the you know, liquid and put another and that's what is plasma and plasma but can be frozen. It could be fresh frozen. It could be fresh. It could be anything. So there's again, different verbiage, but ultimately we an animal that's losing blood and we evaluate the two parameters that are necessary. So it would be the red blood cell count and the protein content because that's what each one's given. And we would say, does it need one or both or does it need just one? Yeah. Obviously, okay. there's so many other health conditions that would need one or the other, et cetera. But that's how we usually store it predominantly would be in red blood cells and in plasma. If you had a nice pet who met the conditions that you mentioned earlier on the show and you have a good relationship with your personal veterinarian, do most veterinarians, are they able to do the blood draw or do they recommend you to go to someplace? Or I know it matters where you live, obviously, but... How do we kind of get more of an army of blood donors that wag or a tail or purr? How do we do that? Yeah, so the storage of blood is actually probably the most important part because it's it's a biological liquid. So it has the ability yeah. to go bad. And so I think only certain facilities have the ability to store it and then if necessary, then to distribute it. So um, it is something that I most times a, a primary care hospital is not going to have the tools to number one, extract the blood properly, and number two, have ability to store, distribute it, etc. So that's not obviously speaking for everyone, but usually it's at an emergency or a specialty facility or another clinic, I guess, that um, specializes in something like that. So it would be something you would have to research a bit in your local area. But yeah, I think well, hopefully your veterinarian might know, hey, you know, 30 minutes away is a blood bank or mm-hmm. something, right? That's why I'm hoping that there's getting more knowledge because there isn't January National dog or pet donor month or something there's a there's a holiday for everything um, but i think that one needs a better pr agent because nobody knows that it is a yeah. holiday celebrated have you ever had to have a pet of your own need a transfusion me no i give tons okay. of transfusions but i um, never had a pet that needed one well we better knock on wood on that um what before we dive into some other fun things you're doing because this show goes by really fast. What's your take-home message to people about the need for blood for dogs, cats? 
Well, go back to the PR um, idea. It's the same with humans, you know, animals every single day, especially now because of just the tools and resources we have both on the emergency side as well as long term care side. Animals are living longer and they have more things happening to them. And so blood products are just as needed uh, in the veterinary space as it is in the human space. And as we see all over, there's always advertisements for, you know, donate if you can, if you're qualified, etc. And so in the pet space, it, if your animal's otherwise healthy and those things we talked about before, the five or six things, they meet that, which millions of animals do, then... I think it's a really good gift. It's a great gift. I mean, it's nice to donate to your shelter. It's, you know, it's it's nice to, to uh, have a, a campaign for, you know, uh, a group. But I think you're given the gift of life. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> or maybe make that possum, right? Awesome, exactly. Yeah. So Dr. Zach Pillasoff, member soft pillow backwards, uh, he does a lot in the field of veterinary medicine. I know you probably have a frequent flyer card and a passport that's been consumed and filled a lot. What is happening coming up? You're usually in South Florida or New York, but uh, you better put on a winter coat because what's happening? Yeah. So uh, this year, I uh, my friend who's a veterinarian uh, last well, last year was uh, telling me about what she's got coming up this year. And she was volunteering at the Iditarod, which is the sled dog race in Alaska every year. So whimsically uh, over dinner, I was like, yeah, I'll apply. Why not? And she was like, was like, how many vets? I was like, how many vets get, uh, you know, taken every year? And they're like, she's like, well, most of them have been going for years to decades. So, you know, it's really hard to get. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I don't have a shot. Well, lo and behold, literally, they picked me this year. So ecstatic oh, when are you going so i'm going to anchorage alaska on uh, february 27th and i'll be out there for about two and a half weeks about 17 18 days and it's my first experience ever there and i'm truly excited it's going to be extremely extremely interesting for sure well i know you know new york and you've got that kind of weather but have you ever been to alaska and how are you going to handle Sub zero. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, it is not easy finding vegan winter clothing because that was a challenge. Goodness, like I was, I was researching for weeks trying to find companies that you know were. They, yes, you have to have some, like certain rating about like negative 100 degrees on this wow. stuff. And, you know, most of them are made of animal products, which you know, for me personally, you know, I don't, I don't do that. So I was like, gosh, how do I, what am I going to do? So um, I literally just finally finished completing the war, the wardrobe only a few days ago, and that's why I'm here. In New York, because I am uh, starting to pack all of my things and bring them back so I can get on that trek soon. Wow. What are going to be some of your roles there at the Iditarod? Because these are hardworking, fast running, long marathon dogs. What What's kind of your, your job going to be? So uh, the first few days, we we do just some general exams on the animals to make sure that they're otherwise healthy. And, you know, they're going to be running hundreds to thousands of miles. So they have to be healthy. And um making sure that, uh, you know, the mushers are kind of prepared for what would happen if they're on the trail. And then throughout the course of the race, they fly you out to different checkpoints along this trail. Oh, so you can be like in a, on a snow, like planes, helicopters, what? Yep. Helicopters to little checkpoints, uh, little hot checkpoints throughout the race. And then um, I think about halfway through, they bring you then from, if you know, your base is Anchorage, and then you go to a different base that would be closer to the second half of the race. And then you continue to do that there. So, wow. So you're looking for like hypothermia. You're looking for ice caked paws that could crack. I mean, what are some of the things you're going to be on the lookout for? Yeah. So pretty similar in the clinic, just a little bit of a different environment. And the number one thing actually that hurts these dogs is GI. So they'll get some uh, GI ulcers that will cause oh, them wow. to have, um, really bad vomiting or lose a lot of fluid or even blood and then, or diarrhea. So those are the animals that a lot of times will need um, immediate resuscitation, but there's also animals that do get wounds on their feet or they get they hurt a soft tissue injury or they, they do get a broken bone. And so we're just basically it's kind of like a rapid fire testing of parameters when they come to these checkpoints, making sure they look good on the outside. And if we do get any type of triggers or flags, then we would try to work it up. So this is probably why you are a critical care and ER veterinarian. I mean, what got you into that specialty area? So when I was younger in the vet space, I initially thought I wanted to be a neurologist because I wanted to kind of do brain surgery. And I thought that was kind of cool. But um, <laughs> I realized that I actually I, I kind of wanted to be more diverse in what I did. So so I then kind of switched to doing emergency medicine as like a relief situation in my local clinic that was there in the, in the local emergency room. And I really loved it. And I found that um, by working with because that clinic had a lot of specialists. So I then was like, all right, I can kind of 
catch up to like the critical care emergency aspect really quickly if I start working in these hospitals that have all these criticalists and taking over their cases or working aside them. So the first year, you know, two years, I basically just worked at hospitals that had criticalists as well. And, you know, kind of forced fed almost like a semi residency onto myself that would have trained me to catch up at least or at least be comfortable with, you know, the heavy majority of cases that would be considered. And, you know, just to make sure, because we, I think you said at the beginning, it, although it was a nice compliment, I'm not board certified in, in critical care. This year, I will be going for uh, board certification, though, in uh, veterinary practice management. And um, I'm okay. sorry, veterinary practice practitioner in feline and canine. So that's my next step, but not critical care. But I appreciate that. Um, and I do work with those people right next, you know, those doctors right next to them. And, and, you know, I'm happy that, you know, most, if not all, trust me to be a colleague of theirs and, and work beside them. So. Okay. Well, you know me, I love being a master in pet first aid CPR because I work with veterinarians and vet techs and we're all about, our lane is to help the pet on the scene and get them safely transported to the vet and make sure we're alerting the vet in route so there's no surprises. And that's where I'm, my passion is. And I've actually done CPR four times. So I've revived two. So that's not bad. That's way better than the uh, the statistics. You see, it's 10, 15%. Yeah. It's, wow, that's great. So there you go. Yeah. So anyway, I am so glad you're here. Thank you for talking about blood donors. How can people find out more about Zach? Hello, Soft. And we got to spell it. P-I-L-O-S-S-O-P-H. Tell us the best media links to find you. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, right now, my focus actually on the personal side has been helping to grow and launch my uh, little project that I just created last year, which is super exciting because the last time we talked, it was still in the final stages. Yeah. But uh, the company is called Naked Pet. And um, it's a combination of some pretty, I guess, some pretty revolutionary product services. So the product side is the first ever luxury vegan hair and skincare line for pets. That's Yay. both preventative and therapeutic. So they're all human grade luxury products that are also, they were all formulated by a human para esthetician. So who basically their job is they essentially take over from surgeries and plastic, plastic surgery, you know, specialist exec and their job is to essentially make the skin in a way that it disappears and that it, it creates um you know long but does it have a y in it spell the website what's it so it's n-a-y-k-e-d-p-e-t -E -E okay good yep it's a little bit special so that's the first half and then the second half which is the side that i'm truly excited about for things like this when we get to talk as well is um is a telehealth service but integrative medicine telehealth so um we have different consultations for uh specific situations in every animal and every pet parent's life. So um, from, you know, we have uh, puppy power classes to geriatric care and longevity, wellness, cannabis consultations. And we even have one that's for um, almost like therapy for pets. If they have anxiety, yeah. things we can do. Um, there's about eight or nine different consoles at the moment that we're looking to expand. Um, once, Will that uh, all be under the naked pet uh, site or okay. Yep. So the product line and also the kind of the telehealth area, integrative. You got it. Yep. Integrative telehealth services. So you you're going to get stuck having me call you again. You know that, right? I hope you don't <laughs> mind. I don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> You've been wonderful. Thank you so much for being on our show. I also want to do a shout out to our producer, Mark Winter. He is the surgeon of sound. Pet Life Radio is the largest pet radio network on the planet. And humbly, this show, Oh Behave, is the longest continuously running pet podcast on the planet. We've been on the air since 2007. So I thank you all for listening, everyone. I'm looking for you all to help me out on my good old YouTube. So please subscribe. It's free. Just go to the Arden Moore channel. I would love it if you would do that. Got a lot of videos and other things there for you. And until next time, this is your flea-free host, Arden Moore, delivering just two words to all you two, three, and four-leggers out there. Oh, behave. Coast to coast and around the world, it's all behave with Arden Moore. Find out why cats and dogs do the things they do and get the latest buzz from wagging tongues and tails in Rin Tin Tinseltown. From famous pet experts and best-selling authors to television and movie stars, you'll get great tail-wagging pet tips and have a fur-flying fun time. All behave with America's pet edutainer, Arden Moore, every week on demand, only on PetLifeRadio.com.